Well, thank you. It is wonderful to see such a big crowd on this winter night. We're going to be talking about different kinds of minds this evening. So let me tell you about one animal, Inky the octopus. A few years ago, he escaped from his home in the National Aquarium in New Zealand when the lid of his tank was left slightly ajar. One night, he climbed to the top of his tank, slid down the other side, crawled across the aquarium floor, and then apparently slithered down a 50-meter drain pipe that emptied directly into the sea and to his freedom. Well, octopuses have no bones in their bodies, so they can squeeze through tiny holes, and they are famous escape artists. Another octopus was found to make regular visits to a different tank in the middle of the night so he could steal crabs and then would return to his own tank. And yet a third octopus, Otto, learned to swing to the top of his tank and squirt water at a low-hanging light bulb, which apparently annoyed him, so he literally learned how to turn the lights off. <laughs> the octopus is amazing for all kinds of reasons. They are, of course, extremely smart, but two-thirds of the neurons are in their, in their arms, which can operate independently from their brains. They recognize individual people. They like some, they don't like others. They usually live alone. And this is the thing that I find absolutely astonishing. Most only live two to three years. So just imagine if the octopus lived as long as we do, and if they could transmit culture across generations, they would rule the world. Now, I mention the octopus because this animal raises all kinds of questions that we'll be talking about this evening. Do they have consciousness? Sure seems like it. Do they have a sense of self? Maybe, but where is it? Is it in the arms or is it in the brain? In some ways, they're very similar to us. They have eyes like we do, even though our common ancestor lived 600 million years ago. In other ways, they're completely different. For one thing, they perceive the world largely through their tactile senses. Can we ever know how an octopus thinks or feels? I have no idea. Maybe someone on our panel can answer that question. So these are profound questions. What exactly is a mind? Where does it come from? How does it relate to intelligence and self-awareness? These are deeply mysterious questions. But we're starting to get some clues on some of these questions. There are amazing scientific breakthroughs all the time that give us some insights here, and we have a wonderful panel to help us uh, think it through. So let me introduce our speakers. Ken Miller is professor of biology at Brown University and president of the National Center for Science Education. In addition to his research on cell biology, he's written extensively on evolution, and in 2005 served as lead witness in the landmark Kitzmiller versus Dover trial on evolution and intelligent design. He's the co-author of high school biology textbooks that are used throughout the country, and his most recent popular book is The Human Instinct, How We Evolved to Have Reason, Consciousness, and Free Will. Carl Safina is an ecologist and professor of nature and humanity at Stony Brook University and the founding president of the nonprofit Safina Center. His early research focused on seabird ecology, and since then he's written widely on animals, sustainability, and conservation. His books include Song of the Blue Ocean, Beyond Words, What Animals Think and Feel, and Becoming Wild, How Animal Cultures Raise Families, Create Beauty, and Achieve Peace. He also hosted the PBS series Saving the Ocean with Carl Safina. Tamar Gendler is Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences and Professor of Philosophy and also Professor of Psychology and Cognitive Science at Yale University. Her research brings together ancient and modern philosophers with the contemporary insights of the psychological sciences. Her books include Intuition, Imagination, and Philosophical Methodology, and she's taught various popular online courses, including Philosophy and the Science of Human Nature. I might add that she was also the first woman to chair Yale's philosophy department in its 200-plus year history. So, welcome, all of you. So, we have a lot on our plate this evening, so let's get right but into no it. no octopuses <laughs> on our plate. <laughs> For centuries, people have tried to explain why humans are different from all other animals, and there have been a lot of different explanations. We are the tool users. 
We are the species with a theory of mind, with the capacity to plan for the future. We're the ones with self-awareness. We're the ones who can transmit cultures across generations. And over the years, all of those explanations have become problematic. There seem to be exceptions down, down, the, down the line. So Carl, I'm going to start with you. How should we think about this question of human uniqueness? Uh, well, first of all, um, when we talk about animals or humans and animals or humans and other animals, you have to remember that animals are everything from sponges to blue whales and orangutans. And uh, the way I think about it is that everything in life is on a sliding scale because life is organically related. We're all one living family. But all these different species do something um, that is unique in some way. And the uniqueness of humans leads to a variety of enormous differences in what we do. When, uh, since I'm an ecologist and an evolutionary biologist, um, my approach to answering these questions are what makes the human species unique as a species, not what do we do now? So we, the answer cannot be, well, we have airplanes, no other animal has airplanes, but why do we have airplanes? I, I think that the thing that most distinguishes us probably is that we have a human kind of language that we can communicate using grammar and syntax that makes what we say um, infinite in, you know, potentially infinite. Um, other animals can say danger. Other animals can say there's a snake or a cat or an eagle, but they can't say, be careful when you go there, I saw a snake yesterday. And our language allows us to do that, which allows us to not only plan ahead, but network across all of our minds. We can basically network our minds that way and network with people who have passed, who were here. I, I think that is the difference that enables everything that we see as the, the things that are human capacities and human properties that we either don't see in any other animals or we see in a, a much more limited form in other animals. But the other thing that I think is really important to keep in mind is there were probably about 20 species of humans. We, we tend to think that there's this gigantic gap between chimpanzees and then humans, but there's a huge history and a huge range of capacity that were on this planet that don't exist anymore. And so there's this apparent gap and this enormous apparent difference. But I, I think in the history of life on Earth, there was a, a much more, uh, as I say, everything is on a sliding scale. I think that sliding scale would be more apparent if we knew more about these other human species that don't exist anymore. And Tamar, let me, let me turn to you. Is there something special, something unique about the human brain that's different from all other animals? So you might think that the features that have been discussed so far bring out two things about the human brain that are relevant. The first, I think, is quite rightly our capacity for language, and most importantly, the permutational capacity of language to represent something arbitrarily complex. That is, because human beings have the capacity for language that is recursively structured, they're able to express and represent things that are arbitrarily complex, and they're not restricted to a space-time point. They operate, as the previous speaker rightly pointed out, across time, across space. That neural capacity that underlies the ability to engage in language is one thing. But the second is that there is a traditional picture that what distinguishes human animals from non-human animals is rationality. So the Greek philosopher Aristotle says, human beings are rational animals. They're embodied beings who are rational. 
And you might think that rationality is represented in the expansion of the prefrontal cortex in human beings, which is a part of the brain that allows one to engage in planning and in the suppression of instinctive tendencies. So to summarize, one is the capacity for language, which brings with it a certain kind of representational skill. And the other is the prefrontal cortex, which brings with it the possibility of selecting from among possible actions on the basis of planning. So, can, so can I my, dissent yes. a little uh -huh. bit? Sure. I, humans are also the only irrational animals. The, the, the only animals that believe things on the basis of no evidence or believe wildly disparate things. All other animals are pragmatists and empiricists. O only humans can be really irrational. But that's, in fact, constitutionally part of rationality. To be capable of rationality is to be capable of irrationality. Non-human animals are what you might call irrational. So notice that with any capacity comes the possibility of the privation of that capacity. So if you aren't rational or irrational, you for free are not irrational. The moment you're rational, you are capable of irrationality. The moment there is moral evaluation attached to your activities, that is the moment what you can do is good, then it becomes possible that what you do is evil. So a lot of the categories of evaluation that we apply to human beings and not to non-human animals are categories where there is a success version, rationality, goodness, virtue, and a failure version, irrationality, or vice. Neither of those categories applies to non-human animals. And well, if can, one can I, 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 I do want to bring Ken into okay. this discussion. So Ken. There, we, can, we can follow up on this. So do you want to weigh in on rational versus irrational, or you know, is there this slide, is it, is it a continuum? Is, is, is well, this me, a matter me, of degree, of difference in kind or difference in degree? L let me go back to your first question, sure. which is what makes humans unique among animals, or what makes us different. And all of the single quality explanations we are tool makers, we are language users, we are social animals and so forth, fail. And they fail simply because these qualities are found in other animals and in fact in many other animals. So what really makes us different is a suite, a collection of capabilities that we have to an extent that is not paralleled by any other animal. And with respect to the whole idea of rationality and Carl's point about being able to, to believe in things without evidence, one of the things that I think really does distinguish the human animal is the ability to um, imagine. And that imagination can extend to fantasy, but it can also extend to practical problems. Like, uh, how do I build a bridge across the East River and the conception by the Roeblings of building a suspension bridge and putting that up in their minds? Our ability to imagine things um, and then occasionally to execute those things, I think is extraordinary. It is not paralleled uh, by other animals in any way. And th but this can, is can really I just, what makes Can, I, can I just jump in there? How do we know that other animals don't have imagination? We, we, they don't build bridges, we know that. No, I, um, I didn't say other animals don't have imagination. I absolutely assure you that my pet Australian Shepherd has a vivid imagination uh, for all sorts of things. Um, but uh, his imagination uh, basically focuses in on sex and food. Um, but, um, you know, the, the, the human conception to build, for example, rational and philosophical systems uh, of the sort that you were talking about, um, that I think really is truly, truly unique uh, to the human animal. And it's one of the things that has made us successful as a species to the point that we are, in terms of biomass, the dominant land mammal on this planet and that success is also the reason we threaten this planet. And that's a, a, that's a point I think that we're gonna to continue to talk about. Carl, I'm, I'm willing to guess that you have some responses here. Yes, but I'm willing to forego those responses for new responses. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think, you know... That's your prefrontal uh, cortex at right, work. Exactly, exactly. I, uh, other animals have imaginations. In other words, they, they think about things that are not right in front of them. Um, like 
um, I want to go for a walk, or I'm, or I'm going back to my den, or I'm going to look for my mate who hasn't come home, things like that. Um, but with humans, I think that we are, it, it's all a matter of degree, and, and humans, I think, are the most extreme animals. We're, we're the most creative, but we're also the most destructive. We're the ones with the greatest capacity for compassion, compassion but also for cruelty. And um, I, to me, it's helpful to think in terms of sliding scales and degrees. Is it useful to, to talk about intelligence here? And uh, intelligence, of course, is a really loaded word in, among scientists. And I mean, there are scientists who talk about not only intelligence of, of mammals, but of insects, of plants. Uh, Ken, do you have a working definition of intelligence? No, I, and, and I wouldn't even venture one. Um, I, it, it, in coming here, I, I, I went to, you know, the, the academic source that we all use and cite as authority, which is Wikipedia, um, <laughs> and, and asked Wikipedia what it thought of intelligence. And uh, it threw a basketful of definitions. The ability to organize, the ability to plan, the ability to construct uh, systems and so forth. Um, the ability to engage in complex thought, whatever complex thought means. And I think intelligence is, is one of those qualities that we certainly attribute to our species, and we attribute it more or less to certain individuals uh, in our species, but it's extremely hard to pin down. Um, I'm a scientist, obviously. Uh, my wife is an artist, and she's made it very clear to me um, that even though uh, she may not understand complex numbers and Riemannian geometry, there is a kind of intelligence built into art that we scientists don't always understand. Um, so I'm not going to proffer um, a rigorous definition and simply say, here's what it is. But it certainly is a collection of qualities that really do set us apart from other animals. Tamara, what, do you have a, a working definition here? I guess what I would say that notions of intelligence have in common is that they represent non-lucky capacities to achieve a particular goal. That is to say, when you speak of these multiple forms of intelligences, the, uh, what an intelligence allows you to do is to reliably achieve an outcome which you aim to achieve more reliably than you would without the intelligence. So to take Carl's point about everything being on a spectrum, you might say something is more or less intelligence with regard to a particular goal depending on how dependent the success of the outcome is on intention as opposed to luck. Is this, is this about decision-making, the, the ability to, you know, it's, it's not just instinct. You, there are choices you could make, and you, so you adjust accordingly. So one of the things, of, instinct is resilient but inflexible. One of the things that instinct has trouble with, that flexible intelligence doesn't have trouble with, is dealing with surprise cases. Instinct is really, really good when you have to do something really fast, really quickly. That's why it's useful to have the capacity to overlearn habits. But you might think intelligence is what guides you to cultivate the habits such that most of the time you will be in a position to be guided by instinct, but you want, in addition to that, the capacity to override the instinct when it's not applicable. Basically, you want to structure your life in such a way that you can do almost everything by carefully cultivated habits so that you have the excess resources available for the moments where habitual behavior isn't the right response to the situation. And I would say that's the notion of intelligence that I'm at least intrigued by. Mm -hmm. So Carl, you've been studying all kinds of different animal species and the, this question of intelligence is really intriguing. I mean, we started out by talking about the octopus, yeah, I, but how do, you, how do you think about that? I think intelligence is the ability to come up with novel solutions to new problems. Something that's a, 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 a problem, you haven't seen this before, you can figure out how to solve it. So that's also obviously on a sliding scale. Um, I think it also interacts with instincts. Um, I mean, we have a language instinct. That's our ability to learn a human language. What we learn depends on what we're 
taught, whether it's English or Vietnamese or whatever. That, that has to do with culture. That, in a way, is a whole different topic. But we, we also, humans also have a, a musical instinct, and then we can learn to be musicians. We have an artistic instinct. We can learn to uh, do all kinds of creative things. So um, in the course of that interplay between instinct and skill acquisition, intelligence comes into play. That's kind of what creativity is in a way. It's finding new responses to problems you haven't encountered before. So could, can you give us some sense of how that is manifested in the, in the animal world that, that might surprise us? Oh, well, um, I guess um, I'll give you one. I, this may not be the best example. It's just one that just came to mind off the top of my head. I, I used to be a falconer. I used to train hawks, and then I used to take them out hunting. And I had, um, I, I had a hawk that was new to all of this, and we, we went rabbit hunting a few times, and this hawk would go straight after a rabbit, and the rabbit would usually dodge, and the hawk would always miss. One day, a rabbit ran into some brush, and the hawk, thinking that he missed, came up from, from being right on the tail of the rabbit, went up like he was just going to go sit in a tree. But the thing was that the brush that the rabbit ran into was backed by a space. So the rabbit ran through the brush, but then out into the open, and the hawk was high at that point. It just folded his wings and nailed the rabbit. After that, that's all the hawk ever did. Never went straight after a rabbit. Went up like this and straight down and got really good at catching rabbits. So you could say, oh, well, that was a trial and error thing. That was an accident. But the learning was instant and permanent. And it was a solution to a problem. So I'm sure if I thought about it more, I could come up with some more of those examples. But that's one that really always stuck with me, you know, because it was such an unusual situation. You get to see a wild animal acquire a skill in, you know, right in front of you within the span of a few seconds and then keep using it. That was just very cool, I thought. I want to come back to this question of instinct because, I mean, it is, I think there was this old idea that, oh, Humans have agency. They're, I mean, obviously we have evol evolutionary drives, but we're not fundamentally governed by instinct. Whereas animals, it's all about instinct. It's all about, you know, evolutionary imperatives. And my sense is that kind of thinking has sort of gone out the window. But I, I don't know. I mean, Ken, how do you think? I, I, I think that's right. I mean, humans have uh, powerful instincts. Uh, many times we tend to bury them. We have, uh, you know, obvious instincts that drive towards food. Uh, a drive towards sex to reproduce and so forth. Um, but there's, you know, an entire field um, that E.O. Wilson once called sociobiology, which is the evolution of social behavior uh, among animals. And when you apply that to humans, uh, you discover some interesting things. And one of those are the instincts we have to behave in certain ways towards people who are blood relatives. And I'll give, I'll give you an example of what I mean. It's sort of a chilling example. Um, there are statistics from the US, from Canada, uh, and from the Scandinavian countries comparing instances of infanticide uh, in families where the father was the biological father of the child victim and where the father was the stepfather. And the instances of infanticide in all cases, fortunately, are extremely rare. But an adopted, a, a, a stepfather, is in various studies uh, anywhere from 50 to 70 times more likely to kill the stepchild than a biological child. Now, that's a chilling statistic, and I remember lecturing about it to my freshman biology class, and I said, it's gonna be shocking. Um, so brace yourself, and all of you who come from families with step-parents might wonder how you survived 
to the age to be university. But even in that case of the stepfather, um, the incidence over a lifetime is something like one in 3,000. So uh, most step parents are loving and effective parents. I believe that absolutely. But what is the instinct that overlays the human tendency towards aggression, human tendency to react violently and so forth, is obviously an, a strong instinct towards the preservation and nurturing of those whom we know and can identify as blood relatives. And I see no other way to sort of uh, account for the origin of that other than to say that is an instinct. And it's an instinct related to something called kin selection. Uh, and kin selection is a, uh, something that happens uh, that basically involves the evolution of altruistic behaviors, self-sacrificing behaviors, which can be favored by evolutionary pressures if they are directed towards those who are close relatives. Because in a way, um, any gene or group of genes motivating such behavior can have an adaptive advantage because that gene is likely engendering behavior that is taking care of copies of itself because that's what family members have is a slice of your own genetic information. So, 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 so those instincts in terms of human behavior are strong even if we don't realize they're there. So let me ask the question in the opposite way. What do you think and I'm addressing this to any of you, what do you think cannot be explained through what we would call evolutionary psychology or, you know, what E.O. Wilson called sociobiology, you know, that it's, it's not fundamentally about survival, reproduction, or, uh, you know, food. Uh, it's just, you know, the, the, those just don't explain it at all. What, what, what falls outside of those categories in humans or in, in other animals? Carl, what, what would I, you say? Well, I, you know, I was taught all of this stuff, very similar to the way you just described it. And I, I, I've always been troubled uh, by, I've always been troubled by that answer because it doesn't, it, it often doesn't seem to ring true. We share almost absolutely all of our genes with each other. And in addition, Sex evolved to mix genes. If genes really were obsessed with reproducing themselves, we would all be parthenogenic species. So it's always seemed to me that there's a lot else going on or there's something wrong with some of the theory. I think there's something right with a lot of the theory, but it's always troubled me. Um, E.O. Wilson's book, Sociobiology, which I loved, simply, to me, simply said, we have no capacities that are not capacitated genetically. We're not just a blank slate that can just self-invent based on capacities we dream up without a genetic template that gives us these capacities. But there may be other answers. I mean, even to the, to the example that you raised, I'm a stepfather. And what comes with being a step-parent? Usually a broken home, a, a dead parent, the, in my case, the rage of my stepdaughter who was mad about everything because she felt that she had to carry the banner for her father. Um, it's difficult. It's not just a biological situation. Um, so I, I just think there's probably other things to it um, I think there's a lot about it that's correct, and I think there are other things that we keep missing because we keep telling ourselves some of the same stories. So, Tamar, let me bring you into this, because you yeah. have a really interesting background to address some of these questions. I mean, you are a philosopher who studies the ancient philosophers, and you are you know, very familiar with, with modern cognitive science. How do you think about these things? In fact, I was the head teaching fellow for a course taught by Stephen Jay Gould. So there's a way in which the sociobiology spandrel debate is one of which I was early a part. So I was like, Carl, I like the reading of Wilson's description uh, of what we have as fundamental capacities. And there's a way in which any 
faculty psychology, anything that's describing how the human mind works, starts with some basic principles and builds things out of it. So you might say, Wilson says it's all built out of what there were evolutionary pressures selecting for that allow you basically to have babies who have babies. So that's a way of thinking about it. But you might think a Freudian picture says, look, there's a bunch of fundamental drives, instincts that are there in the id, and those are basically the desire to continue and reproduce and to have love and affection from those who matter. The ancient philosophers are no different. That is, there's a picture, Plato has this idea that there's parts of the soul, reason and spirit and appetite, and the appetite is what is necessary to sustain one's capacity as a living animal. Basically, the things that your dog dreams of are the things that Plato puts in what he calls the appetitive parts of the soul, Freud puts in the id. So there's no question that the issue of what it is that grounds our capacity to engage with the world gets represented in really different ways, depending on the scientific sophistication that's available to explain how it is that it came about. But you get almost the same answer from Plato that you get from contemporary evolutionary biology. So the, uh, the title of our talk here has to do with the formation of the self. So I think a lot of people would say another distinguishing characteristic of humans is we have this self-awareness. Um, is that, is that the, the crucial thing about what makes us self, whether we have self-awareness? I, I, it, it, it may well be, um, and it depends on what you, what you really mean by a sense of self. Um, one, of the, one of the things that uh, psychologists have em employed for a long time is something that I know you're all familiar with on the panel, and that is the mirror test, uh, which is whether or not an animal can look in a mirror and recognize itself in the mirror as opposed to just uh, some other animal. Um, and I remember at one point my, uh, my wife, who is an equestrian who rides horses, the indoor arena uh, where she brought the horse had uh, uh, over, uh, over the weekend installed a whole series of mirrors, large mirrors, on one end of the arena. And apparently dressage riders really like to do that because then they can watch themselves and make sure they're making every move correctly. And she let her horse loose into this arena and he saw the mirrors and he immediately ran over um, and stared at himself for oh, two or three minutes. And the way she described it is she was pretty sure that all he was saying is, there's another horse over there and he's really good looking. <laughs> um, um, and she was not convinced that he saw himself. But the mirror test is if you can take an animal and perhaps make a mark somewhere on their bodies, maybe with a magic marker, maybe by putting a bandage there. And then if they walk up to the mirror and looking at that reflection, they realize it's on me. Um, that basically is a sense of self. And humans obviously can pass that test. So can chimpanzees. So can bottlenose dolphins, as it turns out. Dogs don't pass the test. Um, and, you know, that you might say that means dogs have no sense of self. That's one way to look at it. The other way to look at it is that we are visual creatures. We evolved in an arboreal environment. That's one of the reasons we have such good vision. Dogs, not so much visual creatures. Their olfactory senses and their auditory senses are what they rely on. So for an animal like a dog, and there are a lot of animals that fall into that category, what you might see visually might seem less important than what you can smell. And you can't smell anything from the other side of the mirror. So, the, so what you're suggesting is that the mirror test can only go so far in, it, in establishing whether another species it, have a sense of self. It, it can indeed only go so far. And to me, the sense of self means that I recognize myself as an individual living organism distinct from other individual living organisms and that I have some agency over my own. I understand my hands and fingers are part of my body and not something else. Carl, what, what, do, do, how much stock do you put in the mirror test? Worst test ever. <laughs> okay, I'm ready for this. 
Um, for one thing, when a wolf is eating an elk's leg, it doesn't bite its own leg by accident. <laughs> Almost every, every animal that is mobile has a sense of self. The sense of self is, as you said, I am an individual distinct from the rest of the environment and distinct from other individuals. When an animal attacks its reflection in the mirror, it's showing that it has a sense of self. You can't fail a mirror test. It's attacking because it thinks that is not me, that's a competitor, that's a potential enemy, or it may start courting because it thinks that's a potential mate because it has a sense of self. If it had no sense of self, it wouldn't react to anything ever at all. It wouldn't know the difference between itself and the environment. It wouldn't be able to get food or mate or fight or anything. So the... Um, the psychology professor who invented the mirror test, which was uh, back in the 70s, his name was Gordon Gallup, and he said, quote, self-awareness provides the ability to contemplate the past, to project into the future, and to speculate on what others are thinking. Have you ever seen any of that in a mirror? No, <laughs> you can't test for that in a mirror. What the mirror test with the mark shows is certain animals can understand reflection, and usually it takes a little while. Usually they have to be used to having a mirror there, then they stare at the mirror, then they figure out, oh, wait a second, it's doing everything I'm doing, that's me. When people showed mirrors to people who had never seen mirrors before, most of them freaked completely out because they didn't know that was them or what the thing was that is a mirror. But that doesn't mean they weren't human. That doesn't mean they didn't have all the same capacities that people have when they're in a society that has mirrors. But, but so, let me just pursue this. I mean, if, if you're saying that essentially every animal has some sense of self, I mean, how, how, far, how far down is probably not the right word, but in terms of sort of complexity or lack of complexity among animals, I mean, are you saying essentially every animal has a sense of self? Yes, not a, but not every animal has a sense of these other things that you can't find in a mirror that Gordon Gallup says, like the ability to contemplate the past or the future or things like that. But a sense that I'm an individual separate from other individuals in the environment, yeah, I think essentially, I mean, certainly all vertebrates absolutely do. Otherwise, you wouldn't be able to function. You would get eaten by anything that comes along. Uh, it, you wouldn't know where the food or the water, you wouldn't know anything, you couldn't function. So yes, I think everything has a sense of self. But these other layers of uh, thought and complexity, that's a different thing. It's not a sense of self, it's a different thing. Tamar, what, what's your take on this? Yeah, I would say, I, I think Carl's critique is an excellent one and it helps isolate what it is that the mirror test shows with regard to visual capacity, which is, the ability to recognize an alternate perspective on the world. That is, what you see in a mirror is what you are seen as being by some entity that stands at a different spatial location than you do. And so there is something interesting that the mirror test shows. You might think the mirror test is a sufficient condition for testing whether something has a sense of self, but unbelievably far from being a necessary condition for testing whether something has a sense of self. Do we know when children really develop this sense of self that they are, you know, separate from, you know, everyone else who's around them? Is there, is there an age when, when that happens? Uh, there's a huge literature in <laughs> developmental psychology about what it is to form the idea of a self. And if you're, you're seriously in analysis, you still haven't formed your sense of self, but keep going, keep going, come every morning <laughs> for an hour. So I, but, but the idea is that the, there are various skills that come online sequentially in predictable orders, and you might think those are marks of what it is to have what ultimately becomes a fully formed sense of self. What, what are some of those stages? So the, the capacity to recognize that 
an action on your part can bring a response from another is one of the first ways in which it's argued that there's a differentiation between self and other. So developmentally in a well-functioning, nurturing situation, a child who, an infant, early infant, who's in need of the basic comforts, which are basically food and warmth, expresses discomfort, and that discomfort is responded to by something in the world. And there's a lot of developmental work which suggests that if you don't experience the world as responsive to your expressed needs, that is, if you are unfortunately spend your early days, and this is about days, in an environment where you're deprived of the sense of yourself as an agent in the world, that you never form what the normative Western conception of a healthy self is. So it depends very early on on the capacity for what can rightly noted as agency, the ability to recognize that something you do causes the world to change in response to what it is that you've done. Yeah, and and you know I've had I've had two daughters, so I've had two examples to sort of watch this sort of thing develop. And and one of the uh, to me the remarkable things is is watching uh, a child in the first year going from simply expressing needs and hoping hoping that they get fulfilled to the point where they realize that the agent fulfilling those needs is another person um, who also has their own moods and their own needs. And, and gradually, uh, at least in my girls, I saw that happen between two and three years old to the point where by the time they were four-year-olds, uh, they understood that mom and dad might have moods and needs of their own. Uh, now I have a grandson, so I'm getting to, to recheck the evaluation of this and watch him as he goes through these stages as well. Um, but this is something that's familiar to, to anyone, anyone who's raised a child under any circumstances, is you see this gradual acquisition, uh, not only of a sense of self, but I think part and parcel of having a sense of self is to realize that there are other selves with whom you interact uh, around you, that there are other beings, and they are independent agents just like you are. Tamara, I was struck by something that you said. You talked about the the Western concept yeah. of self. And I'm wondering if there are cultural differences here. I mean, we know that in the West, we tend to you know, focus on individuality, whereas particularly in some Eastern cultures, less focused on the individual is, do you think, different sense of self? Yeah, I, I mean, there's, there's two sort of academic traditions that look at this. One is an academic tradition that compares the West to the East, and that is in the Nisbet tradition that you're describing, Dick Nisbet's work suggests that Westerners perceive the world individualistically and non-Westerners, that is those raised in a society which has expectations for communal well-being, actually have different perceptual instincts. And some of that has and some of that hasn't held up. There's a lot of incredibly interesting anthropological work, some of it that is written in a, a book that some of you may have read called The Weirdest People in the World, which is about Western educated, industrialized, et cetera. And that suggests that there are certain kinds of expectations and experiences that technology brings with it that bring out characteristics that are not uniformly held across all human structures. And the most interesting place to engage with those kinds of questions is in the anthropological literature, including the old-fashioned, non-woke anthropological literature that involves really, really careful descriptive work. I want to come back to this question of why humans build these incredible technologies, airplanes and cell phones and cities even. And is it, is it because we, we, trans, we can transmit culture? Is it something about the way our brains are wired that's fundamentally different from all other animals that they don't have that capacity? Uh, what, what, how, do, how do we explain that, you know, humans are, you know, taking over the world for better or worse and unlike other animals. Carl, any thoughts there? Well, I think it's, you know, I think it's in this context very important to remember that 
for hundreds of thousands of years, no human had a tool with a moving part. And then there were bows and arrows, which arguably have a moving part. And that condition stayed the same for an extremely long time. I think, as I said, things on a sliding scale, humans as the extreme, I think that, first of all, we're well set up because we have free hands. The hands and the mind probably co-evolved in some of these ways. Um, but I think what we are is we are the extreme tinkerers. Other apes have free hands. They're not as free. They, they are not as dexterous. Um, I think that goes a long way, coupled with our ability to use our language to network with any, any innovation. If you look at culture and non-humans, it's almost impossible to see innovation until people come into the picture and then there's a rapid change. And somebody has to cope with that in some way or do something different or innovate. But other than that, culture in nature and culture in human societies was changed so slowly that you, it was imperceptible to see the changes for hundreds of thousands of years. And much more recently, we've been on this tremendously accelerating track, um, which I think in itself is a little bit hard to account for, other than I think it just has built so much momentum because the, the number of minds that are networked has skyrocketed. I mean, in the 1800, there was a billion people. In my lifetime, the population has tripled. So, so many more minds are applied to everything. And then any little innovation becomes a tool for more innovation, uh, et cetera. That's so you're, you're saying culture is transmitted. So it's not as if it's like the individual I don't know, the, the, our prefrontal cortex does this. It's because... Well, you know, cult we culture is, by definition, the, the things that flow through social learning. And the weird, interesting paradox of culture is that often innovation is suppressed. Uh, people... It's good to... It's easy to see in people. You can even see it in chimpanzees. For instance, if a chimpanzee from a culture where they, uh, let's say, crack nuts with stones, moves into a community where they don't, they stop cracking nuts with stones. It's, it's when in Rome, even for chimpanzees. With humans, innovators are often made to be outcasts. You know, you can't get too far out of line. You can't look too wacky. You can't act too kooky. You, it, it's, it, there's a tremendous amount of pressure for conforming, which suppresses certain kinds of innovation and a lot of creativity, right? Um, and that's part of it, but that's the paradox because there can be no culture without some innovator to create a cultural aspect. Yeah, let, let, let me expand on that a little bit uh, based on something that Carl pointed out a while ago. Um, which is that we are primates, of course, and we are one of the great apes. Um, and uh, even Linnaeus classified us among the great apes. Uh, and those are chimpanzees, gorillas, orangutans, and bonobos. Um, in terms of numbers and biomass, we're pretty much the only biologically successful ones. Um, all of the other great apes are, exist in small, isolated populations, and they really always have. They've always been on the edge of extinction. And going back into the fossil record, as Carl pointed out, um, we are actually, uh, we actually, Homo sapiens, actually emerged as one branch of several parallel branches. So there were several species of people, I call them people, that we would call humans coexisting. We all know about the Neanderthals, but there were several others at the same time. And all of those branches were pruned, and we were the branch that emerged. And, and what was special about us? Uh, and I would argue uh, it wasn't just intelligence. Neanderthal had a bigger brain than we did. Um, but rather, it was sociology. It was the ability to cohere in social groups. Humans are spectacular 
in biological terms, in terms of our ability to form cohesive social groups from non-related individuals. And we are really, some insects are really good at that too, uh, but we are really, really good at that. And that formation of large groups of individuals, many minds, as Carl pointed out, combined with language and especially written language, I think is what really triggered the explosion. What's special about written language? Um, we have language we can communicate person to person. We're doing that right now with a live audience and with each other. But the thing about written language is it enables communication and knowledge sharing between individuals who may never meet each other and who live at different times. It provides a way to accumulate knowledge, and that accumulation of knowledge can result in a sort of cascading of technological development. Um, took a long time to invent the wheel. Took a long time to invent the lever. Uh, but gradually, uh, with the machine age, uh, you have this explosion of technology. And I think that's one of the things that has enabled us, for better or for worse, to, do better or for worse, to dominate the planet. When would you date that, sort of this humans, as you've just described it, essentially coming online? I, I would date this sort of, um, uh, this sort of explosion to the beginning uh, of recorded history. In other words, to the Egyptians, the Greeks, and the Romans. Oh, that recent? Um, yes, uh, oh, in terms of that recently, in terms oh. of the ability to spread knowledge, history, and technology between unrelated individuals uh, and basically to make society the repository of knowledge. I think that's a big deal. I want to extract one additional feature in addition to things like hands that I think is crucial to human development, which turns out to be emotion. That is to say, what is it that causes individuals to become sufficiently passionate about something that they form into groups? It's the deep emotions like pride, the desire to be recognized by others, like love, like hatred. So if you think about the capacity for cohesive sociology of the sort that Ken is describing, and something that would provide the motivation for creativity, it's the combination of having the right shape of body and the right shape of brain, and the right sort of instinctive social grouping, which you can get from being a primate, but on top of that, I think without the layering that emotion provides, you don't have an engine that makes it possible to have the sorts of mass cultural movements. Every war was started because of pride. Every bit of conversation in the last decade in this country around politics has been around a fundamental set of questions of emotion. And that's an additional factor on top of the ones we've discussed. And yet, Carl, I've read your book on how animals think and feel. Non-human animals, some of them have pretty complex emotional lives, don't they? Some of them certainly do, and there are analogies that I think are really interesting, um, you know, among especially some of the social animals. Um, elephants, for instance, they live in female-led family groups. When the males get to be adolescents, they leave. They have a different kind of social life history. Females always stay together. You're always with your mother. You're always with your sisters and all of those children. And what keeps them cohered is really deep emotional bonds. It, it, and they display it in many ways. They display it in the way that they greet and touch. They display it in the anxiety that they show. If they're separated, they have separation anxiety that you can see. Um, one, one of the researchers I was working with was telling me that sometimes on a really, really windy day, when elephants can't hear each other, one of them may be separated from everybody and they, and they suddenly realize, hey, I'm alone. And they start trumpeting and they're, they're all alarmed and they really want to get back to the group. Um, wolves have, wolves live in nuclear families. This thing we call a pack is usually mom and dad and their offspring up to the age of adolescence. And then those offspring leave to try to find their own stake in the world. Very similar to the way we live which is why we have wolves lying around our 
floor and on our sofa and not <laughs> chimpanzees. Chimpanzees do not live that way. They are constantly contesting for dominance. Wolves live in nuclear families. The bonds are really, really tight in those families, but their relationship with other families who hold adjacent territories varies. With some, it's kind of like, you stay there, I'll stay there. And with others, it's quite murderous. And some of them have a tendency to want to expand into your territory. Their territory is not as good quality, there's not as much food there. So that has sparked a lot of conflict in humans, especially, uh, especially some tribal groups. Uh, in the past, not modern wars so much, uh, which tend to be more ideological. Um, sperm whales. Uh, extremely interesting. Well, let me, let me say killer whales first. They're killer whales whose, they, they live in pods, which are family groups. Pods that will socialize are called communities. And then certain communities will not socialize with the adjacent community. They will avoid each other for reasons that have nothing to do with ecology or anything else obvious. It just seems like the cultural differences keep them apart. Sperm whales are the, uh, well, they live in female-led groups like elephants. The families that will socialize are called clans. But the remarkable thing about them is that they have a way of vocally communicating what clan they belong to, and this can be communicated to other sperm whale groups that they have never met before. And sperm whales and human beings are the only known animals who can tell if another individual is a member of a group they belong to, even if they've never met them before, because of some, some representational signal. In our case, it could be language, it could be an insignia, it could be a style of dress. In their case, it's these click patterns called codas that they vocalize that tells everybody which clan they belong to. Fascinating. Um, so we have to talk about machines here, AI, the, which is, of course, all the rage now. And can AI have a sense of self? Uh, does AI, can it have some, some consciousness? Big, huge questions. Uh, I don't know, Tamar, your thoughts on this? So I would say you're not going to have a sense of self without having consciousness. So in, if we hypothesize that AI has consciousness, the question would then be, whether AI would have a sense of self. And you might think a sense of self is what we've been discussing, the recognition of a particular location in the cognitive universe as your locus of subjectivity. That is, it's a perspective from which you view and experience the world. It seems to me once you have consciousness, Nothing precludes having a sense of self, but I think the question is more easily answered by the session that you all attended a month ago. I don't think AI has consciousness, and so I think for free we get that it doesn't have self. If I, AI were to have consciousness, it's hard for me to see what would prevent that from being subjective and circumscribed, which you might think are the two most essential features of being a self. Ken, any thoughts on whether AI might at some point have consciousness or sense of self? Well, I, I'm tempted to say it all depends on what you mean by consciousness. Um, you know, uh, we all regard ourselves as conscious um, because in effect, uh, you might say the scenes that lay out in front of us, whether they are visual or auditory or sensory in one other sense or another are sort of the operating system through which we see the world. And that consciousness, that awareness of what goes on around us is something that in a sense you could program into a computer, into an artificially intelligent program in the sense that it can take in input and react to it and learn from it. Um, but I think there's something very, very different about animal consciousness um, in terms of having this constant view um, uh, not just of the inputs that we see, but of the way in which they relate to ourselves and to the rest of the world. 
Um, so um, I have a very difficult time, uh, except as a matter of science fiction, uh, imagining that an AI system could be truly conscious in the way that, uh, that we mean by consciousness. So I have one final question for each of you, and then we're going to throw it uh, to the audience here. We've been talking about a lot of big ideas and our relationship with the natural world, with the animal world. And I'm wondering what this means for you individually, personally, whether as you've reflected on these questions, whether there are ethical or moral imperatives that come up. The, the most obvious one, I think, as we talk about a relationship with the animal world is what we eat. Uh, and it's what, but it, it could go in a lot of different directions. Uh, Carl, any thoughts here? No. <laughs> um, well, the neurobiologist Christoph Koch came up with a definition of consciousness that I really like. And he said, consciousness is the thing that feels like something. I think that was actually Thomas Nagel who, who came up with that. Uh, okay, well, um, I'm aware of it from, anyway. I like that definition, whoever came up with it. I like that definition, the thing that feels like something. And um, if we think about, many of us have had um, total anesthesia and you lose consciousness, which means that you, f you stop having any perceptions coming through your sense organs. You don't hear anything, you don't see anything, you don't feel anything. And then when you come out of anesthesia, you get reconnected to the sensations that make you aware of the information from your sense organs. In addition to that, we also can think about what we have sensed and form images and things like that. And there is nothing humanly unique about all of those things that I was just talking about, which means that we're, we're in a world of minds with other creatures who have a sense of self. And one of the things they do with their sense of self is they try very hard to stay alive. They don't have any self-loathing. They don't have any depression in the wild. They don't wish to die. They try very hard to stay alive and they're in the world with us and they are of the world just as much as we are. And what we have done, as Ken alluded to, is we have, by virtue of becoming the overwhelmingly dominant species, with now eight billion of us, we have not, we don't just eat them, but we take away where they live. Uh, I think that that is morally wrong. I think it's, in it, I think it's the dilemma of humankind that our way of living in the world has become a, a destructive one, a fundamentally destructive one in the way that our society, this, this outlying Western society has globalized its values. If you look at the, the main values of other cultures, indigenous groups, South Asian groups, East Asian groups, almost all of them share a perception that the human place in the world is to respect the rest of the world and that although humans are not fundamentally better than the rest of the world, we have a special, we have a special responsibility and that is to help maintain the balances in the world. Our culture does not share that view. And our culture has globalized. I don't think it's because our culture is better. I think it's because we've been much more willing to be very violent. And so, yes, I think that the implications are really profound and basically moral ones. Tomorrow, uh, personal implications for how you think about how you want to live based on these kinds of ideas? Yeah, I, I think what Carl said is quite beautiful. And I would put a slight spin on it and say, thinking seriously about self is possible only if you think seriously about other. 
That is, self isn't a thing unless there is something that is non-self, and selves exist in a context of other individuals, each of whom has a perspective on the world that is as real and as vibrant as the perspective on the world that you have. And one of the things that I think is really important in thinking about other is to think about not just points of commonality, that is, other human beings with, one, with whom one shares characteristics, but also the contrastive cases that are provided by non-human animals and in an anthropological context. Ken? Well, one of the things that um, my kids know is even though I'm a biologist, I'm fascinated by astronomy. And they would tell you how many times I woke them up pretty much in the middle of the night to watch a lunar eclipse or to watch a meteor shower. And a few years ago, it was going to be a very clear night. And it was in August, and it was the time of the Perseid meteor shower. Um, so I walked out in our front yard. I got a nice lounge chair. Um, because where I live in southeastern Massachusetts, I sprayed myself with mosquito repellent, uh, laid down, and watched the show. And one of the things that I began to think about is, despite all the remarkable capabilities of other animals in terms of intelligence, communication, planning, foresight, and everything else, we're the only animal that knew that the Perseids were coming. And we're the only ones that sort of took delight in looking up at this fire in the sky. Um, there is something special about the human animal. And we do not downgrade other animals by pointing that out. Um, Jacob Bronowski once said there is something, man is a singular creature. He is not part of the landscape merely, but a shaper of the landscape. Man is the animal who did not find, but came to make his home on every continent. Uh, the late Carl Sagan said, we are the embodiment of the cosmos coming alive and beginning to study itself. And I think that's the responsibility that we bear. Um, and in terms of our presence as the dominant land mammal on this planet, um, Every animal, every living thing on this planet is affected by what we are doing to this planet. But we are, A, the only animal that realizes what's going on, and B, the only animal that realizes that it is responsible for it. So this very idea that, that humans are singular creatures, to me, I think should motivate, certainly motivates me, and I think should motivate all of us to realize that the planet is in crisis, we are the cause of the crisis, and we can do something about it. Pessimism is, paral is, is, is paralytic. Um, we have to be optimistic, but optimism should, leave, uh, should lead to action. And I'll just give you one example. Um, it's way back in the summer of 69. In my youth, uh, I wanted to visit a friend who was working at Yellowstone National Park. So I hitchhiked all the way from the East Coast to Yellowstone, eventually found him, was introduced to a naturalist associated with the Craighead Project uh, at the University of Wyoming, which studies the grizzlies. Uh, and he said, would you like to go out on a hike and we'll camp in one of the wilderness areas in Yellowstone that the tourists don't know about? And I said, that was great, let's do this. And I had my uh, hiking and camping gear with me. And as we left the trailer from the study, um, he reached into a footlocker and put on a holster and plopped the 357 Magnum uh, into the holster. And I said, what is that for? And he said, well, we're going to a place where you are no longer at the top of the food chain. And such places are increasingly rare. And I think we have uh, our, the recognition of ourselves as singular creatures means that we have a responsibility to preserve truly wild spaces. And many of them, much more than we do currently, where you are no longer at the top of the food chain and we can experience the wonderment and the diversity of life uh, as it was meant to be. Um, if we fail that, then we do not just fail the rest of the living world, we impoverish and we fail ourselves. 
Okay, with that. Wow. Uh, <laughs> I'm willing, I'm willing to bet there might be a few questions here. So if you can raise your hands. And you're Who wants to take that? Can we update the mirror test and get a better sense of self here? I'm, it, the, well, 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 the mirror test is flawed for all of the reasons that we talked about. It, it, uh, uh, it, it's overly visual. Uh, in terms of perception of the world, uh, and what it really measures is the ability to understand that a reflection is a reflection. Um, um, but 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 I think for the most part, I completely agree with Carl, which is that just about every uh, animal has a sense of self in terms of self-preservation, self-worth. Evolution has given us that uh, in terms of a suite of behaviors and instincts that preserve the self. Um, and, you know, you know, like I said, there are different degrees of sophistication and understanding, and the mirror test certainly measures some of those. Um, but I'm not really sure how to update it. I, you know, as, as, I, as I told everybody in the green room ahead of time, I'm not a psychologist. I'm just a dumb cell biologist who spent his entire career looking through an electron microscope. Uh, so some of these questions, uh, I'm just not qualified to answer. I think there's two ways. One is you could put urine in different places and see if people could recognize themselves. <laughs> and wait, that, works, that works for my dog. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Like, to your point that we're very visual, we're, we're giving these animals basically a test that says, if you, don't, if you don't have the answers that are on our answer key, you fail. Uh, you can't fail a mirror test. It's just a, it's just a test to see if, uh, if a particular animal can learn to recognize that a reflection is themselves. I don't like the idea really of testing animals. I like the idea of asking, who are you? And watching and trying to describe as well as we can what their attributes are. That to me is how you can have the best chance of learning who we're here with on this planet. So, I don't know. That's not a great answer, but that's my answer. Mm -hmm. And uh, I will just say philosophically, there's a long tradition about thinking about whether it would be possible to have an instantaneous self, whether a self is something that needs to be extended across time through memory and anticipation. Well, I, I'm not at all really a psychologist, and so I might be completely wrong about this, but my sense is that depression is more of a disease of the modern world, the modern human world, that comes from a sense of alienation that has to do with the way that we tend to value self-worth in, uh, I, I, th I think Tamar was talking about the Western view of individuals. In many cultures, you you become a person in relation to your community and how how integrated you are in your community you you become an elder and a community leader by what you contribute to the community by your 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 wisdom basically the generosity of what you've learned and what you can do in, in our culture we learn uh, this kind of rugged individualism where we win by making others lose and we we tend to lose our sense of community it's very fragmented. I, I think that all of these things add to anxiety that leads to depression. But that's just me thinking, uh, you know, as an ecologist. I don't know the psychology or the literature. I, maybe I'm totally off on that. Yeah, but I, I, I would add it is possible to induce depression in animals. Oh, uh, sure. And one of the yeah. ways, one of the ways right. in which you can do that right. Is, right. is by depriving them of uh, the ability uh, to be who they are uh, supposed the ability to be. To be who they are, or for that matter, if they're social animals, uh, rearing them in isolations. If they're human beings, put them in solitary confinement. That'll do it. Yeah. Um, right. And uh, numerous studies show that as they age, and this is a topic that becomes increasingly relevant to me, um, as they age, the happiest people um, 
are those who have the gr greatest number of social, social connections and friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's, uh, you know, despite what you said about our culture being highly individualistic, um, the formation of cohesive social groups is still part of the culture. And those of us who are involved in all sorts of social interactions, whether they're social, uh, work-related, sports-related, and so forth, are the people who tend not to be depressed. Well, the universe is really, really big, and that may be what explains our not having encountered other intelligent beings. So set aside the, is there intelligent life elsewhere in the universe? That's a different panel. That's next year's series. That's not us. No astronomers, just appreciators of it. But on the question, look, for anything that it's possible to satisfy, it's possible to indulge it. And for anything that's possible to indulge, it's possible to exploit it. And exactly what it is that makes it so beautiful that we are able to recognize the need in another and respond to it in a way that is fulfilling, it's exactly that skill the skill of recognizing the need or desire in another and filling it that drives this cycle that you're describing. So the challenge is this, anything rational is also irrational. Anything that is capable of taking joy in the real version of what it is that it wants to take joy in is also capable of being fooled by a surrogate that has all of the apparently relevant features. And so what do we do about that? Uh, we study philosophy and look at the stars. <laughs> no, really, I, I mean, what we do is what we do as human beings, which is you develop self-awareness. One of the things that human beings are incredibly good at do, doing is going one level up. That is, you look not just at the first order thought, but the second one. So you come to be reflective on the degree to which satisfaction of desire is the driver of your activity. It connects to the question that we got from the first questioner. A self is something that's extended over time. How does your present self relate to your future self? How does your individual self relate to the aggregative community? Yeah, the, the, uh, if I remember the study, and I cannot, I cannot give you the latest information about it, sorry. Uh, the FOXP10 mutation made it uh, almost impossible for this family to acquire language. Um, and it turns out that it, this is a, a, what's known as a forkhead transcription factor. Uh, the transcription factor is a protein that binds to DNA and turns on or off other genes. So some transcription factors can... Uh, activate multiple sets of genes or repress multiple sets of genes. And this was very closely associated with language, and it differs between us and our great ape relatives. Uh, so perhaps this is the gene for language. So you might fancifully say at the time, well, that's great, we can do genetic engineering. Let's uh, stick this thing into some mice and see if we can have a chat with them uh, and see how it goes. Um, now, I can't tell you where this has gone, except that in the last few years, we have much more powerful tools to analyze the specific genetic differences down to the DNA base level between us and, and our closest primate relatives. And a study that appeared earlier this month um, basically pinpointed, I think it was in the neighborhood of 71 or 72, genes that are unique to humans, most of which are associated with mental development and which basically involve very tiny mutations in what had been genes for LNC RNAs, long non-coding RNA molecules uh, that are found in our primate relatives but are never expressed. They never get outside the nucleus and are translated. So there's a class of mutations that have enabled uh, these RNA molecules to be translocated out of the nucleus, uh, to be translated on ribosomes and to become proteins, which is to say, to go into action. And 
an inordinate number of these are associated with mental development. Now, there's some very promising, or I shouldn't say promising, very intriguing experiments that have been done with several of these genes. And two of them, for example, if they are deleted from human cerebral cortical organoids, and these are little clusters of human neurons, which you can grow in a culture dish, they set up connections with each other, just like in the cerebral cortex, and they begin to have neural activity. It's a little freaky, because you might say that's a little miniature human brain right there in the dish. If you delete these newly discovered genes, what happens is the connections do not form, the organoid doesn't grow as big, uh, and therefore it looks like it has impaired mental development. There is another experiment that has been posted on the internet but has not yet been peer-reviewed, but damn it, I'm gonna talk about it anyway, um, in which um, these genes were basically transfected into mice, so it became part of their genetic constitution, and what happened is that these mites, uh, these mites developed uh, greater cognitive abilities, better memories, and better uh, scores in terms of running the maze test. So these genes do seem to be unique to humans. We understand how they arose from small changes in the genetic constitution of our primate relatives. They seem to be important for mental development, and they work in mice as well. Um, so that's a little bit freaky. So uh, there are some unique genomic constructions that go into make, making the human brain unique, different from other animals. They're associated with language. They're associated with cognitive abilities. Uh, and we're going to be able to explore much more about these uh, in the next couple of years because the genetic tools we have are now much more powerful. So stay tuned. So on that freaky note, uh, we need to end it because we are out of time. So thank you so much. <laughs>